Welcome everybody and especially our four distinguished guests for this latest feature in our series of Essex Through the Decades as kindly sponsored by Cloud FM um, who are supporting this whole series of events. Um, we've got three uh, former Essex players in Vision um, and one by audio and that's Keith Pont but with us tonight we have David Ackfield, Graham Savile, Stuart Turner and of course Keith and welcome, welcome to you all. Um, the 70s is a period which saw the county evolve off the pitch and on the pitch and uh, particularly on the pitch epitomised by the double winning side of 1979, the first two major trophies that the club uh, had ever won in their 103 year history as it was at the time. Uh, those successes were of course a precursor of what was to become a golden era for the uh, county and uh, each guest here tonight has played a key role in laying the foundations of that. So. Without more ado, let's have some uh, reflections of that age. Um, interestingly, uh, you four guys all played under both Brian Taylor and Keith Fletcher. And I think we should start with reflections on Brian as a captain. Uh, Sav, your, your first your recollections of, of Brian, the Sergeant Major type, uh, particularly, well, wasn't he? Yeah, well, it was quite interesting because I, uh, like the rest of us, we had, uh, apart from Keith, I think, all played under Trevor. Uh, Trevor Bailey was captain when I started, and I know it was with Ackers and Stuart. And then to go from him to Brian was a complete change. You know, I mean, uh, Brian was a, a footballer who uh, tended to um, change, you know, believe in running for miles and chasing balls and playing football and you know whereas, whereas Trevor was more well have a bat have a bowl and just run around the outfield a couple of times so <laughs> there was a complete change in how how we were and I, uh, it, it made a big difference to the club there's no doubt about that you can't you, you could sometimes afford his captaincy but you couldn't afford his enthusiasm and uh, he was good for the lads as well yeah, yeah. David, your your reflections of uh, Tonka? Right man, in the right place at the right time, basically. Um, we were a very, very young and inexperienced side. Brian had played an awful lot of cricket. He was very experienced in that way. Um, heart of gold, basically. He'd do anything for you. He'd do anything for the club. And at that time, the club needed it. Uh, if you look back into the late, again, we go back into the late 60s. I mean, we had about 11 or 12 players, if you were lucky. By the time Brian took over in, in sort of 67, it was still roughly the same. Gradually, those 11 or 12 players uh, managed to become reasonable cricketers. Brian was very instrumental in that. Uh, he always used to say, if you can't play the game, look as if you can. And basically, we, we, were, we had to wear blazers in those days, even for lunch. We had to, uh, our kit had to be immaculately white. He hated dirty pads and things like that, which was all good training for young players. So, excellent man. Yeah. Stuart, did you learn a lot about playing the game from Brian? Um, actually playing the game, possibly, I suppose I did in a way, but as you, as you said, I, I played under Trevor as these, these two did as well, uh, which uh, was, uh, I didn't actually enjoy my cricket that much, to be honest, under Trevor, but as soon as Tonka came along and took over, I, um, I, I blossomed and, uh, as the, the, the guys have said, he, his mantra was, you know, um, fitness and uh, he, he enjoyed um, his almost sergeant major attitude and we respected him for that and, and his kit and everything like that. He didn't believe players could get injured. He didn't believe in physios um, <laughs> in, in those early days. He, he reckoned that, you know, bad players aren't worth it and good players don't need it. Uh, that, <laughs> that was his favourite saying at that time. But he was a wonderful uh, example of, of, of a man who um, wanted Essex to do well and wanted us to do well. And yeah. as, as Sav said, we, he was the sergeant major and we were all the young recruits. Yeah. yeah. So, Keith, you were a, probably a challenge to him, weren't you, really? This young lad coming in and, and I think it was just your seventh first class match. Um, we had the infamous bike incident at Burton. Do you want to talk to us about that one? Um, there's lots of people have written in and asked for an explanation of it. Um, talk us through that one if you can. It, I was a challenge for most people to be fair when I was <laughs> at that age. Um, I was uh, uh, at uh, the age of 17 when I joined. I mean, I, Tonka took me uh, under his wing as such and there was nothing but... <laughs> 
that I could do that was wrong. And uh, much to the uh, chagrin of everybody in the side there, he looked after me, which was brilliant. Um, with regard to the bike incident, I mean, that has obviously done the rounds. And the strange thing about that is that in our careers, you want to be remembered for something, you know, in the cricketing world. Um, and I'm going to be remembered for riding a bicycle on, on the field. It has nothing to do with cricket. Um, but I suppose you've got to be remembered some way. Um, it was a Burton on Trent, uh, 1973. Uh, there was a game against Derby. There were nine people watching the game. So we actually, they'd come from all over the county to watch the play. And there was nothing going on. And what I do remember about that, and of course we are talking now, this is nearly 50 years ago. It's incredible that it's that length of time, but nearly 50 years ago. And um, uh, I was running from third man to third man, and uh, it was sort of the middle of the morning. And at that stage, as, uh, as, as we've been talking about, there wasn't, a lot of, um, there wasn't a lot of running around. So I was starting to get a little tired after about an hour. And I actually said to Brian, can I change with somebody so I do mid on to sort of uh, uh, mid on to third man? So only half the distance. And uh, he said in, uh, with a few expletives, no, you need to carry on, my son, um, so that you get fitter. Well, I'd got down to the bottom end of the ground and Hobbsy was bowling. And there was a guy who looked very much like the Finnish run marathon runner, Lassie Viren. And uh, if you can remember him, and he had a bike with a 26 inch wheel with these, with a saddle right up high. And at the end of the over, I said, can I borrow your bike, mate? And he said he just looked at me and went, uh, yeah, by all means. So I got on this bike and off I set. And the first person to see me was Hobbsy, who pointed and went, what the bloody hell is going on down there? George Pope was umpiring. He saw me. Everybody was now looking and laughing. And then Tonka obviously turned round and he saw me on a bike trying to hurtle across the ground. And of course, when I got to the edge of the uh, uh, when I got to the edge of the um, uh, square, I uh, immediately stuck my um, studs into the uh, uh, into the chain and fell base over apex straight onto the floor. As such, and of course, that then obviously was the story of me riding a bike, which then made various headlines or uh, say made, made some sort of lines in the paper the following day. But uh, it sort of. Uh, it, uh, it was one of those moments that I suppose a lot of people will remember. Only nine people were there at the time. <laughs> <laughs> but now I suppose over 90,000 uh, they were there and uh, saw every moment of it. One of those um, apocryphal things that everybody has uh, banished as well, I suppose. Yeah, as I said to you, it's going to be one of those things I've been remembered for rather yeah. than anything the fact that I might have actually played a rather nice innings at one stage. But, um, you know, I'm sure... <laughs> well, it was, uh, I never, ever played a nice inning, so there we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're unkind to yourself. Well, that was uh, Ken Mowbray um, asked that question, one of many there. Um, we did, we have invited members and supporters to send in uh, a number of questions, and I think if we should uh, move on with some of these. Um, Steve Wilkes um, has asked, we achieved our success with a very small squad. Did players just continue playing when they were injured? Sav, you were um, sort of around at that time, the early early stages, and probably um, when we only had 12 or 13 players yeah. anyway, didn't we? 12, I think, um, at one stage. Uh, yeah, and we, we, well, Fletch was often in the test side as well, and so we were down to 11, and, and we had people like, um, if we had needed him, people like Kenny uh, Wallace who would come and play the odd game from uh, Leon C. Um, but yes, people did play with with injuries, especially the bowlers. I'm, I'm you know, I remember J.K. saying like this, and Stuart, you know, I've got a niggle there, and of course Tonkers, as Stuart said, used to say, <laughs> you know, get on with it, run it off, and and everyone would play. I mean, the only way you could get out of it was probably by uh, breaking something. If you got that, then he might. But even then, you see, he with Bruce Francis one year, and the boys probably remember that. Bruce said he got hit on the thumb, and he kept saying, "My thumb hurts, my thumb hurts," and all that. And eventually, after he played three games where he he didn't look like a batsman, and eventually Tonka allowed him for a go for an X-ray, and he got a broken thumb. <laughs> and he'd been playing, you see, and uh, no wonder he couldn't. Or when he came back and he was fit again, he turned out to be a wonderful player. 
Yeah. So yeah, no, we I think people did play with it, especially the bowlers. Yeah. Did that give? Um, I mean, David, did that give people a, a certain players a certain element of reassurance because um, it was rock up and play, wasn't it? At that time, there weren't too many people challenging for places in the side. I think you were around when we often played three spinners. Uh, we played three spinners right the way through between yeah. something like 66 to 74 when yeah. Keith became captain. Um, yeah, it, 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 it did give you some reassurance. You knew, you, you know, you were pretty sure you were going to play with a bit of luck anyway. Um, I, I, I don't think the modern player would understand, but I mean, I can remember a time in, in the early 70s when we weren't allowed to get injured except on a Sunday because we only had a physiotherapist on a Sunday. He was a football physiotherapist and he only had Sundays off. So we could get injured on a Sunday, but apart from that, we couldn't. And, uh, you know, I don't think we ever thought about injuries, to be honest. I think it was a different mentality now. I think one of my major phobias, if you like, is that people think about injuries now, whereas I don't think we ever did. You didn't expect to be injured. You knew you might get a broken finger that goes with the train, but you didn't really expect to pull back muscles or thigh muscles. Now everybody's worried about this and doing all the training and physics. We didn't. We just played cricket, really. And I've, I've always been a believer that you get fit for cricket and, for, and particularly for bowling. You get fit by bowling, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just away from uh, that a little bit, Nick Sharp has um, written and asked you a question, Stuart. Um, have you memories of uh, your Epping Foresters days? And uh, if you do, how did you first get spotted by Essex? Oh, well, you very fond memories of Epping Foresters. Um, uh, the nice thing about that, I played with my father in the Epping Foresters side. And I was, I was pretty successful at, at that level, scoring lots of runs and that. But my father said to me, he said, look, if you want to do anything in this game, you've got to move on. Uh, and that's when I, I left uh, Foresters and went and played for Buckhurst Hill. And then it was a certain gentleman, Frank Rist, uh, who was a coach with us then, many years ago, lovely man. He apparently heard somebody speaking about this, Stuart Turner's getting a lot of runs and wickets for Buckhurst Hill. Go down and have a look. And uh, that's when I got an invitation to play in a few um, second 11 games. And um, one of my second 11 games was down at Worcester, and we played. We stayed in the hotel called the Diglis, which I think Sav will probably remember. Yeah, so <laughs> well. And um, we played Worcester, and in the Worcester side was a certain Basil D'Oliveira, who was over here qualifying, and uh, I had the temerity to remove his off stump uh, fairly, <laughs> fairly early in the piece. So, uh, and then things moved on from there. Right. Right. Um, as I said earlier, we started with the 70s. We didn't really make our mark too much in the county championship, did we, for, for many years? It was more in the one-day game um, where Essex cricket started to, to blossom um, in the John Player League. We started to finish runners-up and third or fourth in the table. So, I mean, Keith, was there a, was there a particular plan that uh, Tonka and then... Keith Fletcher had decided upon to uh, try and make a su successful one-day side? Yeah, bat first, because we could never chase. That was the one. <laughs> <laughs> we could never ruddy chase. So we did it hat. We, we almost gave up if we were asked to, to, to film, uh, film next. But obviously things changed. And as the guys have alluded to, the side became more experienced as, the, as it went on. And one-day cricket, because... It was just the the type of thing that we that we did. We had a a lot of hard hitting players, um, and they all started to gel together. That was the great thing about the side. Uh, Davies said we were a young side in the early seventies. I mean, when I joined, I played in nineteen seventy. I was only seventeen years old, so I joined a band of people who were very young anyway. And eventually, they sort of moved onwards and all grew up together. So, and it was that playing together and the fact that they enjoyed themselves both on and off the field. Uh, and their company as well, that eventually took us down this route of being a good side. And and Keith uh, Fletcher sort of moulded us into a pretty decent sort of setup. got the, the combination right between um, uh, all-rounders and spinners, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually we started to move forward. And as we got into the mid-80s, uh, sorry, the mid-70s to the end of the 70s, we really were a force to be reckoned with. And I think it was in 1978 we finished runners up in one of the competitions. And I think we, um, it might've even been the championship and I was not the one 
uh, um, the uh, um, the one day as but we were such a good side in 78 as well so I think in a way we knew we were coming to a point where we were going to explode onto the scene yeah yeah well I think they um, I mean, certainly in the one day ga- one day game in the John Player League um, we might have felt that the um, elements and gods were rather conspiring against us I think our best position initially was second in 1971 we finished level on points with Worcestershire um, but lost on over rate of 0.03. That must have hurt, Sad, mustn't it? Oh, it hurt enormously because it was two weeks after we'd finished. We'd finished our games and, and, and we, they had two more games to play and they had to win both of them. And when it came to the last game, I think it was my memories, right, they had to play um, uh, Worcester, Warwickshire and Worcester, I think, uh, which is a local derby. And they had to score at something like eight and a half and over. Well, uh, you know, that wasn't going to happen in those days, um, except that they, they batted, they, if they batted first, they'd been, they, were, they were never going to get the runs, but they didn't. And then they, when they worked it out, they had to score the runs in about 17 overs. And amazingly, they did. Right. They pipped us. <laughs> and we all went to the uh, John Player League dinner, I remember, we were given out runners-up medals, <laughs> which is unbelievably annoying because we really think we should have won it that year. Yeah. yeah. And then four years on, 76, we finished level on points with Leicestershire, but they were given the title, they took the title because of more wins. Yeah. Um, it almost yeah. seemed that uh, somebody was con- making up these rules as we went along, David, is that fair? Uh, certainly on the first occasion, it changed the rules. <laughs> that everybody, had to, um, uh, everybody had to finish on the same day. Uh, it changed the rules because, you know, you weren't then allowed to, you know, you weren't able to know what you had to do. Um, I think, I think one of the things I always felt was that you learn how to win. And I think it took us quite a long time to learn how to win. We probably should have won the John Player League before, uh, you know, we did. But there are occasions when you do learn how to win or you have the confidence that well, whatever happens, you will win. And I think from 79 onwards, we began to win things that we would never have done before. So I think it just took us rather a long time to learn how to win. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul, uh, can, Paul, Paul, can I just say one thing about Tonka? Yeah. Um, and it was, it was, well, the boys here, they were, they were two of the bowlers most of the time in the, in the John Player. Tonka worked out that we had some really, really good, in that early 70s, High side, six late sixes. Some really good batsmen who could hit it a long way. We had some wonderful fielders, people who had fantastic arms. You know, Ed Meads, Lever, uh, Ponty himself. You know, these lads could really throw. So we had good people on the boundary, and we had a bowling attack that Tonka worked out. Four overs each with a new ball, and then eight and the four and an eight, and somebody would swap ends, and and they just bowled in those ways every game. And, um, you know, worked on our fielding. He worked on everybody uh, running and films. And I think he, t- he should take a lot of co- a lot of praise. And it was it was disappointing from him, him as captain that we didn't actually win anything under him. Because I think yeah. we probably should have done. I think Akers and Stewie would agree with that. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. So we move forward to 78. And again, Essex on the cusp of perhaps getting their... Uh, toes in the big time with the final but it wasn't to be semi-final at uh, Somerset and uh, to well be eliminated in the semi-final in the cruelest way possible uh, Somerset got 287 for six we got the 287 but we were all out and they won by lose on the virtue of losing fewer wickets uh, Stuart and Keith that must still hurt mustn't it well, that uh, broke, broke my heart. It was uh, I, I used to drive the van with, with Brian Hardy and uh, that was an awful journey back from, from that game, uh, having come so close uh, and had the rug pulled out from under, under us. Very, very disappointing. Um, and as, as, as Graham said, I, I've always felt that it was very sad that Tonka did not win anything uh, while he was captain. And as you say, he, you know, they pulled the rug from under our feet in the Worcester game in particular. Which, which was very sad. Yeah. That was when um, we played down at, uh, at Taunton, and uh, if I remember right, it was a very hot day that was the whole thing, 287. That's where we used to go and have, the, uh, to go and have lunch in the, 
in the gymnasium there and where the cheese would sweat under the pottery. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, dreadful, dreadful. Anyway, um, the gadget itself, food. <laughs> itself was just great. You know, Neil Smith dived uh, for, a, went for a three and he must have dived about 14 yards before the end there. So we gave him some stick for that. But it was a real shame, actually. And it was the first time, I think, that we'd seen Joel Garner. Um, because he, uh, I think he arrived at the County Hotel. John knew him from uh, overseas trips and uh, I was introduced to him at breakfast and he stood up and I thought, Michael, where's he going at six and eight? Um, and of course, at that stage, we didn't know how good he was going to be. But uh, that was the first time because I batted with Fletch at the time and uh, he was making it exceptionally awkward to play. But a great game of cricket. Um, and uh, am I right in thinking, did Viv get 100 in that game? Oh. Viv. Oh, yeah, I think so. I think he got a hundred in that game. Yeah. Smacked us around apart for a bit. Yeah, can can yeah. I just come in? Can I just come in there on that? Uh, what you've just said there, pointing about being smacked around the park. I remember uh, I I bowled early on in that game against Denning and Rose, <laughs> and I bowled seven overs, seven maidens against them, and then was taken off. And I thought oh, I've done well there. Viv came in and um, I had to come back on after lunch and Viv was just getting himself in. Well, I bowled eight overs, seven maidens, not for 24. <laughs> Six fours in that eighth over. And Fletch came up to me and said, I, and he said, don't worry, Viv, you didn't, I didn't bowl a bad ball. Uh, and he just <laughs> played some unbelievable shots. <laughs> We've got a few more questions here from, uh, uh, from supporters that have uh, sent in questions, but... Um, while we're on here, people are invited to uh, send in some more um, using the Q&A tab. Um, so please get those questions in. Um, one here, um, to each of you, in the 70s, which was the most memorable match you played in and why? Um, Sav? Good Lord. I don't know, really. I, that, I didn't play very many memorable ones, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have anything where we... Yeah, I mean, probably losing to Kent, funny enough, losing to Kent at Leighton in a, in a um, I don't know what it was called then. Was it a Gillette Cup? Gillette Cup. Yeah, it may have been. Uh, I mean, that was one of the sad days. I mean, we we, we thought we bowled them out for 120. And um, we saw that. Uh, probably, let's, if you go on the, up on the right side, probably the most memorable one. It's got to be beating Middlesex in about three hours at, <laughs> at Chalkwell Park. Uh, uh, bowling them out for 52 or something like that. 41. Them off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was unbelievable. It was all over by about half past two or something or two o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that was very memorable. And, yeah. and Mr. Brearley was captain of Middlesex and he said to Brian something about it was a very poor pitch. <laughs> Brian said, no, it's, it's your very poor batting. <laughs> so that, that, would be, that would be, I think, my most memorable game. That one, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> David? Uh, I think the most memorable would be 79, and you may want to go on to that later. But, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, okay. then, uh, I'll leave it for a moment. You want to come back to me on that one? Or I yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah, fine. Stu? Oh, dear me. Uh, there were so many games, that, memorable games. I suppose the obvious one is is the is the BNH final, isn't it? But well, then, I suppose in, in yeah, the in seventy nine the BNH final. I suppose, yes. To, I remember walking down the steps out onto the the playing area, and uh, the the hair stood up on the back of my neck because you could hear the roar of the crowd, and uh, you looked round and it was it was packed. And when you got and, and you got down onto the playing surface, you then went into your bubble and you didn't hear them at all. You were just <laughs> concentrating on what you were doing. Yeah, um, I, I that that was a wonderful, wonderful day for for all of us, and to break our duck uh, and to win win mm. uh, win that trophy was was terrific. Yeah, yeah, Keith, for you. Yeah, for, for me, it's probably um, it's seventy nights, but it's the semi final because it was an opportunity, uh, not an opportunity, but we we had to get through, and I had to play slightly differently when we went out to uh, to bat and chase the runs for Yorkshire. Um, and uh, slowly but surely we got our way through and I got out near the end and, and Stuart actually took over for me to do the finishing uh, 
uh, that, to finish off with Neil Smith. But that was a, that was a very special uh, match indeed. And for me, especially so because uh, I got the man of the match for that particular performance. And the other one was in 19, um, probably 1973 or 74, I got my first 100. And when I got to 99, I edged one uh, for four somewhere. And uh, that was uh, edged someone for four. But I've been dropped seven or nine times getting there. And I think uh, um, um, A.C. Smith said, have you ever tried walking on water, Ponzi? And uh, <laughs> that, was, uh, that was probably one of the, uh, the nicer moments as well, getting the first 100. Uh, can I come in there again? Uh, yeah. Um, at uh, we played um, Glamorgan at, uh, at Valentine's Park, and um, it, that was when I got my first hundred there. But it was what Fletch said at tea time. I'd just gone in just before tea, and I was nine not out, and uh, we came off for tea. And Hobbsy, we lost a wicket. The other, I can't remember who got out, but Hobbsy was due to come in with me after tea. And I remember Fletch looked at both of us and he said, uh, "Good luck, Stewie. See you in a moment, Hobbsy." <laughs> <laughs> and then we went out there and we put we put on 192 for that wicket and Hobby got on uh it was one really rammed it down Fletch's throat <laughs> <laughs> what did he do for <laughs> just, we'll just re rewind a little bit though um 1970 um we actually played on six outgrounds at the time well we played seven if you include the um, illustrious ground at Thames Board Mills, which we used for a John Player game at, down at Purfleet. Um, I think, thankfully, it was rained off after about 13 overs. It was, uh, personally, it was one of the most coldest, bleakest places I think I'd seen. But um, your reflections have uh, one of the week festival weeks we played was at Harlow. Um, in fact, I think it was the only time we played a festival week there. We played a number of one-day games for a while afterwards. Uh, but you rather liked the place, didn't you? It was uh, good to you. <laughs> yeah, well, we played. I think we played Cambridge University and Kent. I think it was, uh, uh, that was what the two games were. And Cambridge University were well, reasonable, but I mean, they're Cambridge University, but they had some players who became very good players. I mean, uh, Majid and Roger Knight and uh, Tony Jordan, who played for us. So they weren't bad side, but the pitch was not great. And we, we managed to, to get enough runs that when they went in, it was turning and Ackers and, um, and Eastie bowled them out. Um, they got, probably got five each or six and four. David will probably remember. And they didn't get many. Um, and, that, and then we played Kent and that was equally bad really. But in that match, I think, and I, I, I don't uh, quote me on it, but I think we made about 107. They got about 300 on the first day, and the right. pitch was quite good. I think Mike Gunness, who joined us later, he he got 100, I think. And um, when we went in, the ball was taking pieces, and they had this Norman Graham guy who was six foot eight, and uh, he could sort of get it bouncing up. And actually, uh, Brian Taylor and I were the only two batsmen, I think, who got double figures, and we both got 70. And I put that down at the time as probably being the best I've ever played on that on a really poor pitch. Yeah. Uh, he got he hit seventy as when we made about one hundred and seventy. I think that's right. right. So yeah, Harlow. But well, I was extremely pleased when they dropped it because it was awful. Yeah, yeah. Um, a game that you'll remember, David, um, and also uh, uh, you, Stuart, as well. Um, when you featured in a last wicket partnership. Um, that was at uh, Swansea in 1974, um, and uh, well, it's surpassed yourself with a bat there, David. I think if you want to talk up, talk us through that one. No, it was perfectly normal. I got 30. You know, I'd expect to do things like that. <laughs> um, I have to say, there was nobody very frightening uh, to bowl in those days down there. It was Tony Cordell, Malcolm Nash, uh, perhaps Lawrence Williams. I think none of them were particularly quick, and uh, certainly in my later career despite the fact they brought in helmets. I mean, uh, you know, there weren't many number 11s who got runs against Clark, Marshall, Holding, Proctor. They just didn't get runs. They were far too quick for number 11s. But on that occasion, he was batting very well, Stuart, and I managed to prop and cop a bit and get a few. And, uh, yeah, we put on 100. And, um, you know, I, don't, I can't remember if we won the game, Stuart. I can't remember at all. I can remember, didn't we? We couldn't. Uh, we couldn't I can't there. remember it, actually. But I, I do remember enjoying some batting. But... Uh, as I say, there was no one very frightening. 
No, no, indeed. And, uh, but Stuart, you were indebted to him for, for helping, oh, helping you I mean, into three figures? When he, when, he, when he came to the wicket, I was 31, and uh, he, he played absolutely tremendously well, supporting me all the way through, running at the right time. And when he got out, I'd got 118 and he got 31. Um, <laughs> which was, uh, it, 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 I always enjoyed batting with that because it was entertaining. <laughs> I, think, I think we could have been run out on about 14 occasions between his 95 and 100. <laughs> the ball was going backwards and forwards and I was standing in the middle of the wicket laughing at one stage. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think it, was, about, it was entertaining to say the least. <laughs> my memory of Stuart was that uh, batting with him was a little bit of a, a lottery when run between the wickets. If he, hit, if he hit the ball hard, he ran, even if it got yeah. straight to somebody's field. <laughs> So, I think he got quite a few people in his book. Uh, yes. Is um, that right? Mike, yeah, but Mike Dennis said, I, I'm not in your book, are you? Next game, I managed to get him in my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Actually, can I, just, just a quick recap on, on Tonka and injuries. You mentioned the Thames Bald Mill game on, on the <laughs> old wicket, and he got, Tonka got hit over the eye in that game, and it opened his uh, eyebrow up. I remember Charlie Simpson going out and said, oh, it needs some stitches. And, and Tonka looked him in the eye and said, don't worry about that, son. Just put a paper clip in it. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that was his attitude to being injured. Well, it, wasn't, it a, wasn't it a temple built, uh, built whatever they called it? What was it called? Temple, 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 temple. temple. Wasn't, wasn't it there where he actually got injured? We were, play, we were, we were playing Kent at um, Moat Park. Park. Um, mm. Sorry? It was Maidstone. Yeah, Maidstone, Moat Park. And then he got um, injured the day before. Yeah. Well, yeah, on the did he? We no. played. We should have played on the Saturday, and it yeah. rained off. And then we played at, there on the Sunday, and I thought he got injured there because I can no, remember no. him trying to run around the field after the game, trying to run it off. Is that? Is that had, when Richard? Yeah, he spent, yeah when Richard, Richard Baker played. played. We, we hadn't yeah. played. Yeah. He we spent hadn't the played whole at of the all game on the game on the ground, didn't he? Yeah, he spent the whole of the game. game. We put in, uh, we brought in a wicketkeeper, Richard Baker, and he spent the whole of the game running around the ground to run it off. And he did. He played <laughs> he the next game. He wouldn't have anybody else keep. So that was, that, was, <laughs> that, right, that was about his first game for about four hundred and fifty. Yeah. he hadn't played for it. Yeah. He, he yeah. had even when he didn't keep wicket, in, which he didn't sometimes when there was the yeah, other right. tailor there. He would still uh, and Rodney Cass played a bit, and uh, and he would be. Um, just playing as a batter, he still played Tonka, and so he never missed a game for about I don't know how many years. But he had to miss this one because he really, literally, couldn't walk, could he? Uh, <laughs> so that was Thames Ball Mills. But... <laughs> Keith, uh, talk, talking of Glamorgan earlier on, um, you got sweet memories of an innings at Leighton against them. You scored 110, didn't you? Um, three sixes, 17 fours. Um, but as I understand it, you got you, that wasn't good enough to get you in any of the next four matches. No, well, what happened there? You've got to remember, we, had a, we did have a good side then. And uh, yeah, you come in and, and take the place of, and I think I'd come in at that stage for Keith Boyce, who'd got injured. So I came in, did my job, got 100, and then it was the shaking of the hands, good luck, and then enjoy your, enjoy your trip at Horton on the Hill against Northampton Sector 11. So, you know, that's, the, that's basically what happened. And uh, it happened to me on two different occasions, which yeah. in essence, is, it was a tough thing to take, especially if you're trying to sort of develop your own career. But you've got to look back at it and say that some of the players and the team itself was so good that you just had to fit in as and when it was necessary. Um, and let's to be, let's be fair, if Ken McEwen had gone through a bit of a bad patch and then decided he wanted to come back in again, it didn't matter how many runs you were going to get, um, he was going to come back in because of the brilliant player that he was. So you just had to... We had a great squad of players who came in and did their job. Yeah, yeah. Was the consolation, though, that perhaps you were all, um, a, a fixture in the one-day side, so you always knew you were going to be playing in that... Uh, that to, in that competition as well? Well, yeah, the consolation to me was that Keith Fletcher knew my name. So, um, <laughs> but, but generally, yeah, I played a lot of one-day cricket, uh, more than I did, uh, obviously, on the three-day. But, of course, like everything, everybody else, you enjoy the three-day, or as it was then, as four-day now, but the three-day cricket, because that's what you want to do, to try and build an innings and to build a career as such. But, yeah, uh, yeah it was lovely to be in the one-day side because that's where... There was the uh, the crowds and everything else that went with it. Yeah, yeah. I want to focus in a minute. Oh, on, oh, focus, oh. Carry oh. on, go. 
I was just going to say, Keith, Keith mentioned somebody, and I, I'd like to mention him because I, I think he was a fantastic cricketer and actually a great bloke to play with, was Keith Boyce. Right. I mean, sadly, you know, he died at the age of 53, and, um, you know, we all know his lifestyle wasn't the best. But as a cricketer and as a person, he was just superb. Um, and I, you know, he would bowl his heart out. He'd try and hit every other ball out of the ground. He'd get out LBW sweeping and say it was missing. I mean, the whole stories we could have on Keith Boyce, but uh, he was a really, really fine cricketer. And I think we were very lucky that when he left, when he had to pack up in 77, I think, we were lucky enough to get another West Indian, uh, Norbert Phillips. Yeah. who, again, although maybe not as good a cricketer as Boise, um, was it, well, these boys played with him, I didn't, but he was a decent bloke. He could bowl quick and he could bowl medium pace. I mean, it just depended on how he felt. And again, he could bat, couldn't he, boys? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we were very, very lucky with our choice. Huh? Yeah, there was a string of successful overseas players, weren't there? Sav mentioned Boyce there, I think Lee Irvine um, as well, then Kenny McEwen. Um, yeah, Kenny the, was brilliant. What was the strategy about getting these successful overseas players? What, um, how, how did we go about them? Because it wasn't just luck, was it? That was how mm, cheap they were. No, we had plenty of contacts at those days. Doug, Doug had lots of contacts in Australia and he had contacts in South Africa. Um, but I think with Kenny, that came through Tony Gregg, who told Fletch in an England thing that Sussex had got him and they couldn't have him because they'd already got someone else as an overseas player. And he said, right. so he'd been playing for Sussex Seconds, I think, and we brought him up. I think we took him up to Scotland, didn't we, lads? Yeah. Oh, yeah. the infamous <laughs> Scottish trip. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there. No, we don't want to go there. But we, <laughs> we took him up to Perth, I think it was, and Hobbsy was captain. Because East Atfield and Lever were playing for England under 25s or something, weren't they? Or under... And, and Tom Cook was an England selector, so he didn't come. So we had Hobbs as captain. And we had Kenny, who was on trial, in effect. And a young Michael McAvoy came up. He was about 16. Yeah. And, we only, and I had a broken thumb, and I played. Yeah, they were never the same again after that Scottish trip. <laughs> he told, he told, I know, so I had to fill. I did, I did a ponty. I filled his third man both ends, so I hopefully didn't couldn't have to stop the ball because my right hand was got this broken thumb, and I was going to bat eleven, but they didn't. Unfortunately, uh, I think Edmeade's got whacking very hundred against them, and uh, I didn't have to bat anyway. But uh, yeah, that was a fun. But Kenny played there, and he got forty or fifty, and we all went, "Oh, he can play, can't he?" And the next thing is, we signed him. And yeah. he was brilliant. I think the real answer to your question, Paul, is that we used to go for people who were not particularly famous, partly because we probably couldn't afford them. But if you look at the people oh, we had during the 70s, none of them were superstars. The first superstar we had was Alan Border. When did we get Alan Border then, Akers? Pardon? We got Alan Border in the 80s. 80s. Uh, yeah. 85. But if you look at the Bruce Francis's, Ken McEwen, um, all of those people, Nobody uh, even Mark Wall. Was... Mark Wall was not a superstar when he came to us by any means. Oh, no. It was Alan Border who recommended. So we yeah. did tend to go for people who had something to prove. That was the real thing. We didn't want someone just to coast along and have a joyride over our, you know, you know, six months of county cricket. We went for younger people who were cheaper, obviously, but also with something to prove. And it worked on virtually every occasion. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, we were, we were um, unlucky with Hugh Page, weren't we? Because he got, Hugh Page injured, got injured, but, but he was yeah. he was the one I was thinking when I said virtually. Everyone yeah, else he, really he, did uh, add to add any minutes amount to the team. Yeah. yeah, we've got a couple of questions uh, coming while we've been on it here. Um, first from uh, Raymond Verrills, who asked if Stuart could talk about the beginnings he had at Ilford quite early in his career. Um, possibly that was the one you mentioned earlier with with Hobbsy, was it, Stuart? That's yeah. That sounds like the the innings. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I was fortunate. I was also fortunate on that day because they had uh, one of the quickest guys in the country. A fellow called uh, Jeff Jones, left arm quickie. Uh, of course, his son went on to play for England and sadly got injured. But he um, did his elbow after about three overs. Uh, so <laughs> he took no further part in the game to everyone's relief, particularly Hobbsy's. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and as, as David said earlier, it was Malcolm Nash, Tony Cordell, 
but there was a, a fine uh, fella called Don Shepherd who was a, who was a pretty good bowler. But um, it was a, yeah, it was a, it was a, a ridiculous um, uh, partnership really. When Hobbsy came to wicket, we just kept playing and playing and playing. Hobbsy kept whacking it. I whacked the odd one and that, and it just kept going and going. And I got to 96, 97. Hobbsy had got his hundred and he got out. And uh, I think we were nine down then, or might have been eight. And I thought, oh, am I, I going to get a hundred? Anyway, I, I got there in the end, and uh, it was uh, it was a wonderful day. It really, yeah. and it was a lovely day too. Yeah, uh, weather-wise, yeah. it was, a, and we we won the game quite easily, in, in, if I remember in the end. Well, we've had a question here from uh, Stuart Tockley, um, who says his first game at Chelmsford was against Yorkshire in '72. After losing early wickets, we chased down the last day target. I remember the three Keiths batting well. Any recollections of that day uh, to the panel? Uh, Ponty, were you in that? Uh, against who? Into one of the Keiths? Against who? Yorkshire in 72. Oh, yes. Yes, I remember that one. That was um, Keith Flesher had gone in there. I think Boise had gone in there and just wound up. We wanted about 100. We got 164 in 18 overs, which in those days was sort of mm. unheard of to get that sort of chase up front. These days they do it in 10 overs but I mean in those days it was unheard of and I had to go in and I joined I can't remember if I joined Keith Boyce or whoever it was and Richard Hutton was playing for them Tony Nicholson was playing for them and Boycott was playing as well and uh, we chased down the runs and uh, it was just a, a very special day and I do remember that I hit one ball off um, whoever it was Richard Hutton or Nicholson and uh, I was caught in front of the stand by boycott, uh, hmm. right in front of a crowd of like five or 600 in a stand like that. And he turned to the crowd who'd been giving him a dreadful stick and he held the ball up to him, and giving it all that one. And of course, what he hadn't realized was that the umpire had called no ball. And whilst he was holding it, we scampered another one. <laughs> oh, that fearful stick that time. <laughs> Um, we had another question here, and I want to sort of uh, spend a bit of time on the 79 and uh, that successful season, but just a couple more questions here. Um, that 79, of course, masterminded by Fletch. Um, we haven't talked too much about the merits of his captaincy. Um, Stuart, what was, what was Fletch's um, secret, if you like? Well, he had a fine, a fine cricket brain. Uh, that that was the the big thing. He wasn't a great one at team talks uh, uh, in in the dressing room, but once he got on the field, it was uh, quite. Um, he, he was an artist to watch. We were, I would often think to myself sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> on a on a on a flat. Just leave you for a second. Um, on a, I'd often think sometimes on a flat wicket, say at Chelmsford, nothing was happening. And we'd suddenly have two or three men round the bat, where Ackers was bowling or, or, or Raymond East. And we thought, well, what's, what's going on? And what he was doing was putting doubt in the, in the incoming batsmen's minds that there is something going on here. But of course, yeah. there, there, there wasn't. And, uh, but they would think there was something going on. We'd have two men round the bat, three men round the bat. And a, sure enough, a, a catch would be, would be popped up. He was, he was a great uh, encourager too. Uh, I remember sometimes he used to come to me at the end of my run or things weren't going quite right. And he, you know, he'd, he'd encourage me. And he, 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 I, setting the fields, um, I mean, I would ask for things or ask his, and ask his advice. And he was very good at setting fields as well. Um, he had a terrific cricket brain. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and he, he really did. Yeah. David, you were very close to Fletch, weren't you? Got close to him over the years. Um, you know, used to uh, sort of try and bring some sort of quality, I think, particularly off the field, didn't you, to the eating, <laughs> eating habits. But um, you were a small number, I think. The rest preferred the uh, burgers and chips, didn't they? Yeah, we, yeah Keith and I, um, well, we worked out that we could see, if we were away for four days, for instance, like, you know, the Saturday, Sunday, Monday, if we saved the meal money on the, uh, on, the, on the first night and the last night, then Keith and I could enjoy a couple of bottles of wine quite nicely, good wine <laughs> and good food. And that's what we enjoyed doing. And Keith always used to say to me when I was having a bad time out on the field, which was quite often, uh, he said, don't worry, Ackles, the dark hours are coming. Nice bottle of wine soon, which cheered me up eventually. <laughs> and I kept going somehow. But uh, yeah, he was, a, he was a great friend. Well, he's a great friend. And uh, he was a, an extremely, extremely intelligent captain. 
I always remember when Mike really wrote the famous book about captaincy. And I think someone asked Keith about it and he said, of course, he hadn't read it because he didn't read things like that. And I said, don't bother either. You're doing exactly what he does. If we don't talk about it. It's, um, <laughs> he's very good. Very good captain indeed. The, yeah. He's certainly he, the best tactical captain I've ever played under. Not a great yeah. man manager. Um, whether that affected him when he went to England, I don't know. But he, but he wasn't a great man manager. But we knew him. We knew him well. We knew his his tempers, his temper, everything else. We knew everything about him. But, you know, I'd grown up with him from since 1966, you know. So, um, you know, he was a very, very fine captain. Yeah, yeah. Did he, um, I mean, well, could he be ruthless in the dressing room, you know, the old sort yeah. of throwing the teacups if necessary? Yeah, his, fir his first game, the first game as captain, uh, it, it was a real shock. Uh, he <laughs> took over from Tonka in 1973 for one game at Hampshire. And uh, it was a wet wicket, and David Turner, who was quite difficult to bowl at, he got a lot of runs, and he shouldn't have done, and we should have bowled him out, basically. Easton and I should have bowled him out. And uh, we wandered off, and as usual, in Essex in those days, we just played, and thinking about the bar, and what was going to happen in the night, and everything else. <laughs> and he tore a strip off us, which we'd never had, even from Tonker, or Trevor, or anybody. It was the worst exhibition of bowling I've ever seen in my life. I did great. Oh! So Hobbsy and I went out on our own in that evening. Uh, that was basically, I didn't go out with him that night, I assure you. But, yeah, he could, he could be pretty, uh, he could be, and he could be ruthless. I mean, he, he didn't, he never picked sides on friendship, I assure you that, right. as I'm the living proof of that one, quite often. I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, he never picked it on that. So no, he could be ruthless. He, he, yeah. he, he was tough, yeah, he could be. He was yeah. a tough little player as well. Yeah, yeah, he had his, seemed to have an encyclopedic knowledge of, batsman didn't he as, as yep. you know as they were walking out down those pavilion stairs he was already setting the field for them wasn't he and uh, I used to um I used to say he used to always like men round the bat and I didn't like men round the bat I like saving runs always I I like bowling maidens so therefore the more people round the bat the more gaps there were the more runs there were yeah. and he used to say right well I have you 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 and I said I seem to have got a gap down there one gap at least and he said well you well, you haven't now, you can have another one. Shut up and get on with your bowling. So that was key for you. So. <laughs> Chaps, we, we've got to move forward to uh, 79. So much else we could talk about, but uh, we've got to do service to that 1790. And, um, well, David, you mentioned earlier um, a couple of matches in 79 that stick in your mind. Well, um, yeah, obviously, I mean, the, the championship games. Uh, uh, share those with us. Well, the... the the 79 season for Ray and me was a very strange season indeed, because uh, by July, by the South End week, I don't think we'd got 12 wickets between us. The Seamers, the three of them, JK, Stewie and Norbert, had just bowled everybody out. And so far, and so much so that uh, the side were making up nicknames. I was the Seamers sweater carrier. I was the Seamers ball shiner and various other rude ones, which we won't repeat. And we literally didn't bowl. I hadn't played the game before the game against Knox. Knox was the crucial game. Knox were our major rivals. I hadn't played the game before at all. We hadn't got JK. We hadn't got Gucci. We were in trouble. Stuart got runs. He put some runs on. I, I managed to hang around again for a little while. And we put on about 30 or 40 at the end before Richard Hadley bowled me a bounce when I fell all over my stumps. Um, and then all of a sudden it was turning. and they had 140 to win or something, and Ray and I had to bowl them out. And I hadn't bowled, I hadn't bowled for two games. Ray hadn't played, I hadn't played for two games. Ray hadn't bowled for the game. Suddenly we had to bowl them out. We did it somehow, I don't know how, we breathed a sigh of relief, and that really set us on the way, I think. That, 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 that proved, for a start, that we could, with, with, you know, without JK and Gucci and people, we, we could do it. And it also gave me and Ray some confidence because we hadn't got any at all because we hadn't bowled at all. And from then on, we played on a, on a couple of turning wickets. And because of that, we were able to carry on and win some games. So for me, that was the most memorable game, really, because it you know, gave me some confidence, gave us some confidence to win the game. Yeah, yeah. Well, that yeah, stand you mentioned there um, was um, 40 runs. Essex won by 46 runs in the end. So the value of that was underlying there, Stuart, wasn't it? Absolutely. It was, it was Akers at his best again, just being stubborn, uh, even against uh, somebody of the quality of, uh, of Richard Hadley. And uh, it, it gave us the, the 150 or 60 it was that uh, were needed. And these, these, got, these guys bowled them out. 
because we, yeah. we were um, on the back foot, the seamers, we hadn't done very well. We were taken off fairly, and they, they were going very well. And then Akers and uh, Easty came on and uh, the, the game changed dramatically. And, uh, and as, as David says, I think that set us on our way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The first uh, title, of course, was the B&H. Um, obviously a favourite trophy for Essex. They'd never won anything before. Um, they, finally, they finally got across the line. Uh, Keith, you played a significant part in getting us there, didn't you? That uh, semi-final against Yorkshire. Um, and, uh, uh, well, I think uh, your contribution, the key contributor towards that victory. And then the great memories of that. Well, I think I've spoken before about the, the, the semi-final, which was a, a personally you know, a, something that I was extremely pleased about because obviously I had to play a, a different role than I normally play, which was to get in there and get runs quickly. This was about trying to help guide the side through uh, in the semi-final when we were 99 for four. And we, were, uh, we could be and were always have, had been, at, up until that point, been quite a fragile side chasing. But we managed to get through, which was extremely pleasing. And then to play in the final itself... And Stuart was quite right. He pointed out saying the hairs on the back of your head when you go out to the final. I mean, we were very lucky to to walk out on that day with you know, 26, 30,000 people. And when we drove from the hotel and well, we came down to the uh, to the ground itself before the game, I mean, the Essex supporters that were spilling out the, the station was just enormous. So the, the atmosphere was extraordinary. It was electric, um, where it seemed to be that 80 to 90 percent of the supporters were Essex. So it was a wonderful, wonderful day, hot day, um, and getting 290 grand playing the most magnificent innings uh, of 100. And we all chipped in and did our bit there and, and bits and pieces. And of course, Surrey were no, uh, no slouches when it came to uh, you know, playing, and they had some mighty fine players. And in the end, Roger Knight and Jeff Howth did very well, and I was lucky to have bowled a couple of balls which they got out to. And, you know, I, I, I didn't actually keep the runs down too much, but those two wickets seemed to be quite vital at a particular time. I mean, Stuart bowled very well and all the other guys did. And I, it was everybody came in, good catching. And in the end, John Lieber finished it all off with Norbert. And what a day. I mean, something that will live in the memory of all of us uh, as the first match and something that I'm very proud of that I played in. Yeah, indeed. And then we moved on from, from there, Stuart, uh, went to Wantage Road um, and lifted the, lifted the championship. Um, um, another phenomenal performance. Um, and, you know, I think in that, in that occasion, you got five wickets in both innings, didn't you? I, I did, yes. Um, uh, that was, uh, yeah, I enjoyed that very much. But uh, yeah, tremendous occasion. And I think... Uh, Peter Edwards came up with a, a boot full of champagne, but it wasn't quite, wasn't quite uh, sure what was happening with the other games, if I remember. We were waiting for another, some result, which went our way. And, uh, we, uh, and, and Brian Hardy got 100 that day as well. Played really well. Mike Dines got runs. And um, it's always nice to, to do it. I mean, Northampton wasn't a very glamorous place to play your cricket. Not, not then. And the ground was, it was all right. But uh, yeah, I had success, and we we lifted the trophy, which was a which was a great day. And yeah. to get ten wickets as well in the game was a uh, uh, very enjoyable. Yeah, yeah. And you were at the crease punty when the winning runs were scored, weren't you? Yeah, absolutely. It was uh, great for me. So you go down the record books as being there at I think it was eight not out, and the Hardy was one hundred and four not out, or one hundred and three <laughs> not out, and he was on ninety nine, and I was facing a new over, and I blocked him. I blocked all of them. And I, I forget who bowled it. It was something like Jim Yardley. Um, and I just blocked a maiden purely so that, uh, that Brian could have his go. And he did. And I think it was the first ball the next over. He hit for four and away we won. But because, I, you know, that was going to be the thing. that It was Brian Hardy getting 100 in the final innings to take us through. So, yeah, it was a, a wonderful experience. And we all celebrated a rat-infested pavilion. <laughs> And David, you played your part along with Ray um, during that season, obviously, um, taking so many valuable wickets. Um, were you able to believe at that time Essex had actually lifted a trophy, having spent so many years trying to win things and perhaps believing that you weren't ever meant to be Cinderella's throughout your game? I think, as I said earlier, we, we took a... I think we you took a long time to learn how to win, really. Um, 1978, we came second, but I don't think we were... 
anywhere near winning it in those days. But I, I don't think we were surprised. And actually, I, I think for a lot of us, um, there was a sense of relief that we'd finally got that monkey off our back, basically. I think we felt that um, we, we, we'd underachieved, if you like. We'd, we'd got so far, so near, yet so far. So I think there was a big element of relief as well as enjoyment and everything else about it. The most interesting, the, I, I, I mean, to say that we won it, but we won it with about four or five games to go as well. Yeah. And the last four games were, were actually some of the funniest I've ever played in. Um, because we won. I mean, for instance, at Leicester, um, we were well behind on the over eight. We had an over eight in those days. And you remember that we all came off after 100 overs in the first innings. Right. And we all bowled off one pace in that first innings at Leicester. We bowled 100 overs by half past two. Even JK <laughs> bowled off one pace. I fielded a slip and bowled, fielded slip, bowled. And we got through 100 overs right. simply to get the over eight up, which I think really probably brought the game into disrepute. But... Uh, it wasn't quite what they had in mind, but we did it. And they were very funny days uh, because we won and we went to Scarborough. Scarborough's a great place to go if you're happy and won games. And so it was a, yeah, it was a very nice experience. Yeah, yeah. Well, Mike Stringer's um, asked a, a question. Which of the two trophies that we won in 1979 meant the most and why? And Sav, I've, I've asked that question to you. I know you weren't a, a playing member of that side, but you were involved in coaching. Um, you were the first uh, coach that Essex had appointed for the indoor school. So you were involved, uh, heavily involved, weren't you? You might not have been on the field, but certainly off the field. Uh, in your estimation, which was the uh, which was the best of the two to win? Oh, it's a difficult. I mean, I, I, I would have thought from the players' point of view, the championship, you know, it's that's fantastic to win that because you're the best team. Whereas in, in the... Um, the cup competitions, you know, you can you can keep winning, and you know it's it's not quite the same. But the day at Lords, well, I mean, I I was very lucky that I spent most of the day in the dressing room at Lords, watching from there. I think I did. I sit with you, Akers, because you you weren't playing, yeah. were you? Oh, yeah, uh, and I, <laughs> yeah, and we we sat there and watched it from there, and it was just such a day. And the, I, I'll always remember. I will never ever forget watching Gucci and Mike Janess go out to bat. And the uh, the ground just erupted as they went out on the on the field with all these Essex supporters. It was just unbelievable. So I would have said the championship as a player, if, you know, but the day at Lords was something that we look, I don't think anybody would ever forget. And another thing I want to say very quickly is we talked about Keith Fletcher as a captain, um, and Keith was. Uh, I mean, I played in a time when Tonka was captain and Fletch used to stand next to me and tell Tonka what to do. <laughs> but Tonka, was, you know, he talked about how ruthless he was. I'll tell you how ruthless he was. And the boys will remember this. Alan Lilly played in every match in the Benson Hedges Cup up to the semi-final. And then for the final, he decided to play Mike Deness instead of... Now, that was, a, that was an amazing... It was the right decision... But it was a really hard decision to do. But, he, but Keith, that was Keith. He said, best of the team. We want the experience of Dines as opposed to Lil. And he did it. And it yeah. worked out. Was that right, boys? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He just, that, that was Fletch how he was. And people, you know, Ponty got 100 and got left out the next game. That's the way he was. He, he, I, he just, was um, I said he was ruthless and, yeah. and no friendship. You should remember that I played in the first all the qualifying games of that because Ray was injured. Yeah, right. And actually, I felt right at the top of the game. And I always remember against Warwickshire in the quarter final, he came up to me and, in his usual tactful way, he said, You ain't playing. <laughs> and I put on my best Cambridge accent and said, Upon what do you base that hypothesis, Keith? To which he replied with two words, and that was the end of that conversation for the day, really. <laughs> but that, you know, there was no friendship. He, he believed that no. Ray was the right yeah. man. I'd done a I thought I'd done a really good job in all the qualifiers, but no, gone. So yeah. I said, you know, he didn't, he didn't take any friendship or ruthless. He was very ruthless in that, that way. Whatever yeah. is good for the side, do it. But I was asked the other day why I was such a great friend to him, despite the fact that he, you know, used to leave me out of games and things which were important. I mean, I'd never played in a Lord's final. And, he, uh, and the answer was because I knew he was doing it for the sake of the side. It was, uh, you know, there was nothing personal in it. It was pure and simple. What's good for Essex? That's yeah. all that matters. So... Yeah. 
Yeah, but you would have gone for the championship anyway, would you, David? Had you? Well, yeah, obviously, uh, I'd go for the championship because I, I didn't experience the final, but in any of the finals. But yeah, I, I mean, I think I think most professional cricketers will still say that the championship is the one you want to win because it's the one that tests every part of the game. Um, it shows you've got a really balanced side, and that's what we had in those days. We had we covered all the bases. So I think the championship is the one, even now, that people really want to win. But it doesn't have the glamour of the great Lords finals. Of course it doesn't. No. No, no. Stuart, what about you? I mean, you're, you're, as an all-rounder, um, you were rightly acclaimed the most valuable player in John Player League uh, for a decade, weren't you? And, and beyond. Um, and very, very unfortunate to not to get an England cap, but that's probably another hour's uh, conversation <laughs> just about the merits of that. Um, but, but for you, uh, the one day competition or the championship? Oh, as the boys have said, uh, the championship is like winning the Premier League in football. Yeah. Uh, that's the, 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 golden, uh, the golden ticket, if you like. But of course, the one day game had such a bearing on my own career, um, especially the Sunday League game which I think uh, made me as a cricketer when it first came in in 68, I think. And uh, we, our first game, I think, was or one of the first games was against Notts at to Chelmsford. And uh, I managed to get runs in that game. But Gary Sobers was playing for Notts, funnily enough. And, oh. um, and I thought, what, this is a good game, this. And we, the totals they chase now don't bear any um, resemblance to what they chase now, uh, get now. We, we would defend totals of 150, 140, 150, because we were an absolutely brilliant fielding side uh, as well. But I used to get a little bit annoyed and peaked at times when people, oh, the one-day cricketer, Stuart Turner. Um, I played 360 first-class games as well. So I think uh, that uh, throws that one out of the window. But I've, I've been very fortunate in, in my, my whole career. Yeah, yeah. And Keith, for you, for your... Uh, the uh, trophy you prefer most? Yeah, I, I think the guys have said it and I, I concur with them. I mean, the, 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 the longer game is something where you've got a chance to, with your bowling, you can you can tease batsmen out. You don't have to actually bowl that, that just to stop runs. You're trying to get people out and batting. You're trying to build an innings as a total because there's two innings. The one day game is absolutely amazing. And, and David, when he said about the atmosphere that there was, at the uh, uh, you know Lords, it was just extraordinary, and it was electric. I mean, there's no two ways about it, and it did make the hairs on the back of your head stand on end when Dennis and, and Gooch walked out there. It, it was 26,000 people, and I'm sure 24,000 stood up. It was just <laughs> amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah, yeah. It was one of the keys to success as well. Um, <laughs> this phrase, team spirit, which is thrown around. Um, quite loosely uh, about successful sides but I say this with yourselves because you all grew up together didn't you you you, you knew the, the hard times the hard slog of playing for Essex cricket without any reality of winning anything then all of a sudden as we said earlier the side started to evolve first of all under Brian then under Keith um, and became winners and in fact set the standard for the for the golden age that, that followed your success um, is that true that there was such a strong bond between all of you? Yeah, I think, well, yeah. Well, from my yeah, point of view, which I'm obviously a lot earlier than these boys went on to the big success, but from my point of view, from uh, playing under Trevor, for instance, where there was there was Trevor Bailey and Barry Knight and you know the England players, and and then there was a few young people like Ackers, Stewie, me coming in, Fletch. Uh, then when Tonka took over, apart from Gordon Barker and um, Brian himself, I think everybody was 25 or under. And so, and we knew there's only 12 of us, so we knew that, you know, we were going to play and we, if someone dropped out, no one, you know, if you missed a game, okay, you missed a game. If you came back in, and I think that, you know, uh, well, I used to say to people, when, when we do go out tonight, we do go out mainly together. It's not not those two and those two and those three. It's, you know, it was the boys going out to, for something to eat. It was quite a lot of us going. Yeah. So I think that did build friendships. And the, the fact is, it's only in November, we um, seven of us went to Ray, Ray's wedding. I mean, you know, seven of that, well, <laughs> me and six of the guys who'd won the thing. 
They still yeah. meet up. And when they meet up, we have a good time. Yeah. Your feelings, Stuart? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've, I've actually missed, because of the uh, coronavirus thing, I've missed our Players' Day uh, on a Sunday, which should have been... Uh, was, it, was it this Sunday, David? Yeah, it should have been. This is July, it would have been. Yeah. But yeah, and I, I, I because, because as I said, the stories and the the guys get together. We're we're all the camaraderie uh, of the Essex dressing room was was second to none. And I have to say that's one of the things. When I retired, I missed the dressing room. I missed the away trips, cricket, of course. But the camaraderie is uh, fantastic. And other uh, other county teams, I think, were quite envious of our camaraderie. And most of them used to think we would start raving bonkers, <laughs> which uh, we pro probably were at times with the characters like Eastie in the side and uh, it, it was a wonderful time and all through my career I've, I've done everything I love doing what I do and I got paid for it so I've been very very fortunate yeah Keith you were um of a, they talk about Ray East as being a comedian but uh, you had your moments of comedy didn't you um never far from a from, from smile and I guess you brought that to the game and it was just it must have been marvelous just coming in playing cricket uh, for a living well, it was. I mean, that's what you dream of doing. I mean, you certainly didn't. You didn't do it for the money. That was for sure. Um, and it was only in later life that you ended up with a, potentially a reasonable amount of uh, of money. I think my first my first contract, I was paid eight hundred pounds. I think for the summer. <laughs> Um, and then you went on the dole uh, for the six months because you certainly couldn't get a job anywhere. Um, so there was lots of things that were going on. But uh, yeah, people, the, the, the side was full of characters. It wasn't just about Ray or myself. Everybody fitted in. I mean, uh, you've got the guys on, on, on the screen now. Very funny people. Stuart, very funny. I mean, Akers, I love Akers. Some of the stories and things that he does, absolutely brilliant. As me and Stitches and Graham as well. Just brilliant how everybody just gelled together. Now, we all had our moments of where there was a bit of uh, antagonism, but that, you know, that's always going to be within the side. But to be honest with you, it was terrific, not only off the field, but it was on the field too. Uh, and that was the great thing about it. And just one small thing, you know, uh, so there's loads of stories, but when you get Lever coming, uh, coming uh, out after tea against Cambridge on a cold uh, April <laughs> day, bowling a cake as the first ball afterwards, and Don Osley having said play and then losing marbles because he's now said this is in the book, having, having bowled a butterfly cake. <laughs> It was. Uh, it gave me the idea of what we're doing, and and I also in that game, I, I think that um, David was asked to bowl, and it was so cold. David refused to pick the ball up when it was hit back to him, would stop it with his studs. Some of your old memories as of playing for Essex. Sorry, just your memories of playing for Essex, David. Oh, uh, just. Well I, well, I think Clive Radley summed it up to me, the Middlesex player, the other day. They used to come to Chelmsford, laugh for three days and lose. He said, and basically <laughs> that's, uh, that was it. Um, he said, we don't know what happened. We just laughed our way through the game. It, it was one non stop fun. Terrific fun. The, you know, the one thing that people, I mean, there were people who said that we took it to extremes. But to, to me... We never took ourselves seriously, but we, but we took the game very seriously. And that was the difference. Uh, that was, people mistook, you know, the bonhomie, the fun, the japes, the bars, the drinking, the rest of it. They mistook it for not taking the game seriously. We took it incredibly seriously all the time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, I mean, I can only endorse the friendship. I mean, we still, as you just said, I mean, we meet up and it's just like, it's just like we met, you know, last week sort of thing. And we carry on with the stories. And the wives sit on one side and we chat away on the other, you know, with a pint in the hand. And that's quite simple, really. That's what happens. So nothing changes, really. And it's gone on for 50-odd you know, years. Yeah. Well, sadly, yeah. gentlemen, with uh, time has beaten us and we've got to uh, bring this to a close. Uh, thanks to Cloud FM for sponsoring this series of events. Uh, we hope that all the watching have enjoyed the evening and look forward to uh, continuing with similars in the coming weeks uh, with former players. Please feel free to send any feedback in to the club, how you enjoy this. Uh, to you, gentlemen, thank you. Each one all absolute pleasure talking to you. Absolutely fascinating. It's something we should do more often, I'm sure. Um, as Bob Hope would, say, would always say, thanks for the memories. Uh, been tremendous. Thanks all very, very much.
keep safe, keep well, and look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, cheers, lads. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks Paul. Cheers, all. Yeah.